It's detective work. It's, it's just infinitely fascinating to me. What's not to love? Oh, yeah. I wanted to be a vet. Grown up in the country and wanted to be a large animal vet. Didn't get into vet school. Got really entranced by bird migration research when I was an undergrad. Published a couple of papers. Got really into bats. Bats is what I want to do with my life. Yes, bats. Went to Trinidad, did bats for a year. Didn't pan out. So I learned genetics. Did a, uh, what ended up being a master's degree on frogs. Back to Cornell. Another new faculty member had come to campus. He, he asked me, he's like, so, uh, study fish. Oh, they're wet and they're cold and they're slimy. Ew. Uh, can I scuba dive? He goes, no, 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 uh, that's, a, that's a recreational sport. It's got nothing to do with research. He said, okay, if you want to scuba dive. But that's what I finally did my PhD in and I've never looked back. It's, it's an absolute blast. It's a great field to work in. My bent, I think, all along was animal behavior. I, I think of that as sort of my true love, is, is behavioral ecology. And even doing this very applied field of lake trout restoration, at the back of it all is like, why do they do that? Or what do we expect them to do? The background behind all of this research that we're doing is that lake trout were extirpated from the Great Lakes and from Lake Champlain. So in Lake Champlain, they disappeared by 1900. Canada and the US under the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, who fund our research, have been trying to restore lake trout ever since the 1960s. The restoration pro program means that hatcheries stock lake trout as fall fingerlings or spring yearlings. In lake Champlain we stock now about 84,000 per year. And those fish grow up successfully, they become mature, they find spawning sites like this one. We know they deposit eggs, we know the eggs hatch into fry free embryos and that's the point at which uh, restoration stops for reasons we don't fully understand. Those little fry never show up again later in life. They die. They disappear. 44. In the last decade we've started to see yearlings and older of these wild fish. So something's changing allowing them to survive. Yes, yes, yes. I mean just that, that, that right there, that's it. That's what it's all about. We're basically doing a lot of projects that all, one way or another, tie into this problem of lake trout recruitment or now, why are they recruiting so well? The thyme and issue is one that we have to solve or understand. The background behind the project is the problem that predators that eat alewife end up with insufficient thiamine. They're generally okay, but they don't partition enough of it to their eggs. The eggs can develop with low levels of thiamine, but when they hatch and the fry start to develop, they tend to die. The theory that Matt Fuchsia and I are working on with our colleague in Brockport, New York, uh, Jacques Rinchard, is that there's a lot of thiamine in the world. Plants produce thiamine, the vitamin B. So there's no particular reason to feel that the water is depauperate in the thiamine, and the eggs are sitting in that water for six months until they hatch. So our hypothesis is the eggs could be soaking in the vitamin B that they need over that six months and restore whatever deficiency they've got. Do we worry about the thiamine or do we put that aside and find some other reason for the impediment towards restoration? Any project like this has multiple people involved and really I'm just, it's called the principal investigator, meaning I get the money and support the project. Um, the project is done by the graduate students and the, and the postdocs. What we're doing today is putting egg bags underwater. Basically, what we're going to do is incubate eggs in natural water, where we've got eggs from females. We know how much thiamine was in the eggs by testing them immediately after they spawned. Find one, I'll give it to you. Yeah. I'll go find the And then we'll one. incubate them in the natural water in egg bags, which is throughout the winter, and then we'll test them again at, at three stages, where we're raising them under laboratory conditions and be able to compare that with what's happening in the wild. What we hope is that at the end of winter, after they've been soaking in thiamine for six months, their thiamine levels will have, are elevated, or are higher than they were at the beginning of the winter when they were first fertilized. And that would say, this thiamine issue is not as big a problem as we think it is because they have access to this thiamine and can soak it in. A big thing we're doing right now is looking at spawning behavior. 
forever people have said, well, they, they, they broadcast spawn, right? They just, females got about 15,000 eggs and she just comes in, she just broadcasts eggs and the males fertilize them. And a colleague and I who think the same way in terms of behavioral ecology are both going, no, that can't be true. Their eggs are huge. They're filled with lipid. It's a massive investment that she's built over the year. It could be you know, up to a quarter to a third her body weight. And she's just going to go, yeah, whoever wants to fertilize this, that's just fine by me. No, 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 no. She's going to be picky. She's going to take the males she thinks are the, the best, the fittest, the sexiest, whatever. So then the question turns into, how does she choose them? This is, this is fascinating. How, do you, how does evolution work? behaviorally. How does she be get the fittest offspring by being the choosiest female? It's fascinating. So we've got an ecosystem here that is being managed and particularly it's being managed for the fish that people want to recreationally angle for. And the favorite fish are the big pisivores, which are things like walleye and Atlantic salmon and lake trout. In a native ecosystem that isn't being managed, that sort of takes care of itself. Forage base goes down, and so the predators don't reproduce as well, and their population goes down, so the forage picks up, and things stay in balance. So we have a food web study going on that's trying to model where everything fits into the food web of Lake Champlain. Basically, it's a lot of who eats who. 060, 39, when, where, to really establish what the food web looks like in this lake. So this information about predator-prey balance is absolutely essential to manage a system that is being artificially stocked and the predators are under human control, you might say. What's the, what's the take-home message? From a science and a public standpoint, this is an incredible resource. So appreciate this lake and protect it.